Right now, I'd like to shift the focus and talk about a recent tragedy involving a teenage boy who was shot dead by two undercover police officers in New York this past weekend. His name was Kamani Gray. He was a 16-year-old African-American living in Brooklyn. The tragedy started when the officers came across Gray standing with a small group of people. At that point, the young man began to adjust the waistband of his pants, which the police called suspicious behavior. According to the NYPD's account, the officers then asked Gray to show his hands, but instead, he pulled out a gun. The police then fired a total of 11 rounds, striking Gray several times. And while the NYPD is claiming no fault, a plethora of witnesses have come forward in recent days to share their own accounts of what really happened. One person claims Kamani was running for his life when he was shot dead, and another says he wasn't holding a gun at all. It's a sad story that raises an all-too-familiar all too question. What gives the NYPD the right to be judge, jury, and executioner? To talk specifically about this case, as well as other cases of the NYPD's recent egregious infringement on civil liberties, I'm joined now by Pete Ayer, co-founder, writer, and editor of copblock.org. Thanks so much for joining me, Pete. Appreciate you having me on, Abby. So large crowds have obviously been demonstrating since the shooting in Brooklyn. I want to talk about the multiple eyewitness accounts, that question if he even had a gun. I mean, is it possible that the police completely manufactured this detail to justify them shooting him? Uh, that's definitely possible. You know, uh, it's happened in the past and in other circumstances, and I wouldn't put it past them in this situation. Uh, unfortunately, you know, unless video evidence or some objective documentation exists, it'll just be the word of those wearing badges against the word of, you know, some other people who claim a different uh, scenario unfolded. And, and unfortunately, uh, that's really the shame, Pete, and we see this time and time again where um, it's really their word against the, the victim. And when there's no video footage revealing the truth, uh, it is kind of a predetermined verdict in that end. But I wanted to talk about the, the fact that they were undercover. We've also heard a lot of recent accounts of undercover police just shooting and killing people. Um, how could he be expected to yield to authority if he doesn't even know that they are authority? Right, or I mean, if if he's even should should we you and I and, and this uh, individual even grant these folks authority who claim it just because it's claimed? I mean, I would, uh, you know, the fact that these individuals involved were undercover is yet another step removed from transparency from even their colleagues who do wear you know uniforms and things. And, and this is uh, a, a, as unfortunate as the situation is. You know, these types of things will continue to happen until they don't. So you know, I think it's it's uh, wise to try to get uh, Mr. Gray some attention and, and try to do some damage control with this incident and hold accountable the people that were in the wrong. But to really uh, pre help prevent this from happening in the future, I think we need to, uh, like you said, ask questions about the use of undercovers and even the uh, looking past that, the provision of law enforcement as a good or service through a course of a monopoly where there is no incentive to, to uh, appease and, and uh, have customer service or y yet alone even be accountable. It does seem like it is a huge problem, even if Kamini did have a gun, uh, to have two undercover officers in plain clothes, uh, likely not identifying themselves as police. I mean, when they pull out a gun and tell you to disarm, I mean, if you're in a bad part of town, I mean, I'm from Oakland, and like that, that's just a huge problem in itself. So I think that that's a really good, uh, important point that you just brought up of this, the case of undercover officers doing this kind of activity. Let's talk about the greater NYPD. It seems like every day I'm reading more and more headlines about their criminal activity. Let's talk about JRIP, the Juvenile Robbery Intervention Program, where cops are literally stalking and harassing teenagers who might be susceptible to criminal activity. Do you think that these tactics will work? I sure don't. And I actually look, just looked at the press release that was uh, issued in 2009 about JRIP. And uh, one of the, they concludes by saying we give them two choices, they being the juveniles. They can continue their criminal activity and deal with it and swift and harsh punishment or they could turn their lives around and steer clear of criminal lifestyle so essentially they're saying you like if, if you continue to be on our radar you're going to be dealt with you know through our ransoms or cages and if you don't then or, but obviously we'd all prefer to live in a safe community uh the fact that the police are uh you know uh, riding these juveniles that are in their system even at a greater extent and greater level. I mean, once you get in, into their system, that's essentially, uh, it's easier for them to, to track you and to try to control you, to get you on probation violations and other things. So I, don't, I definitely don't think it's a step in the right direction. It just means more uh, supposed oversight from people 
that are operating from a top-down hierarchy that have no incentive to actually bring about a good conclusion. Their incentive is to, uh, you know, have job uh, security and to and to perpetuate these sorts of programs and to say more actions that were legal yesterday are illegal today, so that more people are dubbed criminals and that they could expand the size and scope of their operations. Uh, good point. Um, it is almost like pre-crime monitoring just to get these kids in the grid, um, you know, and, and also just bringing the pre-crime aspect of it. Let's talk about the surveillance of Muslim communities. Of course, we know that they were overstepping into New Jersey as well. Uh, a new report that came out details the detrimental effects the NYPD spine has had on Muslim communities. I mean, we already know that it was illegal, but it essentially says that Muslims are not even scared to enter mosques. They're scared to even be affiliated with other Muslims to practice their religion and even to watch Al Jazeera. I mean, it's heartbreaking, Pete. Does this not just epitomize the chilling effect and what damage do you think this is going to do in the long run here? It sure does, and it, and it uh, again underscores this divisiveness that these folks who claim authority over us um, operate according to. They want to single out specific groups. What, today it's Muslims, in the past it's been other groups um, that they they claim might have higher you know rates of certain activities that they don't want to happen so they they allocate more resources there and then they're either going to find things and if they don't find them they're going to create issues you know just to justify their efforts and we've seen that happen time and again and uh you know there's uh fortunately a lot of people aren't just being chilled and being allowed to uh, letting themselves and their own actions be uh negatively impacted by these um, programs and policies. You know, there's a, a book that just came out called Voluntary Islam that really accentuates that uh, it, just because an individual happens to be of a certain faith, Islam, that doesn't necessarily mean that they're violent. And, and you know, it's it, not at all. So um, it, it just uh, underscores the fact, you know, this this massive course of hierarchy that uh, exists in New York City that has 35,000 employees called the NYPD. I mean, they need justification for their budget. They need justification for their tools and, and their employees. So they're going to go out and try to find issues where none exist or create them. And uh, I, I hope that, you know, people continue to see through that and continue to connect with each other on a local community level. Absolutely. And, uh, and don't allow themselves to be, you know, led by fear. But, uh, but through love. Absolutely, Pete. Beautifully put. And I also heard that the NYPD is setting up shop in Tel Aviv, Israel. So, I mean, their budget's massive. Definitely need to justify that budget. Thank you so much for coming on, sharing your take. Pete Ayer, co-founder, writer, and editor for Cop Block. Thank you. There's my kid. Don't tell me how much time I spent helping the Prime Minister.